let's take a quick look at coral reefs, a very important marine ecosystem which unfortunately is under threat in many areas of the world. We'll start by just looking at a few photos that I took in Vanuatu. I was there a few years ago with a number of uh, students on an excursion and uh, just during our snorkeling, in many cases just straight off the beach, these are the sort of images that we saw. So we can see coral reefs are very colourful places and also there are a number of different types of corals. Here we see these plate-like structures here, um, here's a big mound of coral. So corals do actually have a number of different, uh, different forms that they take, which we will look at in just a sec. Let's just finish off these photos, and here we go, types of coral. We can see there are quite a number of different types, whether they're branching or massive. So in that photo earlier, we saw a massive one. We saw a few of these plate-like corals. Um, corals are often um, thought of as these branching. When you say coral reef, this is what a lot of people tend to think of. Um, but as you can see, we've got encrusting where they just sort of cover the ground. We've got free living, conna, uh, fallacious, so it's more sort of like foliage, like leaf-like. So we do actually have a number of different types of coral. Now, what are corals? Actually, well, corals are made up of tiny invertebrate animals called polyps. So invertebrate, that just means they don't actually have a spine. So tiny animals called polyps make up the corals. They are actually part of the phylum Nidaria, which also includes sea anemones, hydroids and jellyfish. Uh, many polyps together we call a colony. Now a single polyp has a tube-shaped body with a mouth surrounded by tentacles. Here we go, here is a single coral polyp. Okay, so tube shaped, tentacles sticking out the top, mouth in the middle. Now, what polyps actually do is they produce a skeleton of calcium carbonate. We can see that down here, the calcium carbonate skeleton. This is why a lot of corals um, seem hard. This is the, the skeleton, the hard structure of the corals. The calcium carbonate is also known as limestone, it's CaCO3. Uh, during the day, or when threatened, the coral polyps actually withdraw into this protective framework. Now when feeding, the polyps stretch out their tentacles to gather food. Now the tentacles actually have small uh, stinging cells called nematocysts. So we can see that labelled here, we've got a little tiny part of the, um, the tentacle sort of blown out and we've got these nematocysts here. And on the diagram on the right we can see them labelled here as well, nematocysts. So tiny stinging cells, um, these actually shoot out little poison spears into tiny animals that are drifting by. So these tiny animals are zooplankton, the tiny uh, microscopic and very small uh, little animals there. So we've got these uh, stinging cells, nematocysts. Now thankfully only a few corals have stinging cells which are powerful enough to affect humans. So we're generally okay. But the zooplankton, which just got taken out by this little poison spear, uh, that gets passed by the tentacles into the mouth of the uh, polyp. So the tentacles, once this, here, wait, let's do this, there's a little, little something swimming by, uh, the nematocyst sends out this little spare, this guy is not happy anymore, and then the tentacles reach up and pull it down into the mouth. Now in addition to catching zooplankton, polyps also get nourishment from a different source. This other source are the zooxanthellae. Zooxanthellae are actually single-celled algae living inside the tissue of the polyp. So here's an image here, there's a photo on the left of zooxanthellae. Um, they are algae that gain shelter um, from the corals, and the corals gain food. There is a mutualistic symbiosis relationship, because the zooxanthellae require uh, sunlight for photosynthesis, so they're making their own food, but then the uh, coral polyps get nutrition from this as well. Now because the zooxanthellae are doing photosynthesis, they actually need um, sunlight for this, so corals can only live in nice, clear, brightly lit waters, so that their um, zooxanthellae inside their tissues can do their good little uh, photosynthesis thing. 
Now, actually, the coral polyps get up to 95% of their nutrition from this mutualistic relationship. Mutualistic um, symbiosis relationship, it just means that uh, both organisms benefit. So, as I mentioned, the zooxanthellae so get shelter and the coral polyps get um, nutrition. Now, natural white light is made up of all the colors of the rainbow. However, underwater these colors are absorbed at different depths, with red actually being absorbed first. And this can often give the coral reefs more of a sort of blue-green appearance. Photographs and video of corals are often taken using bright lights to show the true colors of the coral reef. If you just go snorkeling um, for yourself, you might notice a bit of a, a bluish greenish uh, tinge when you're snorkeling around them. So if you want to take photos, make sure your flash is turned on. Now, there are three types of reef, fringing, barrier, and atoll. So here's a photo um, taken from Mystery Island in Vanuatu. This is a fringing reef, the most common type of reef. Uh, fringing reefs are located very close to the land and often form a shallow lagoon between the beach and the main body of the reef. So in this photo, uh, we can't really see the reef so much, but those waves crashing just out there, not too far out, that's uh, where the reef is. That's why there are waves crashing there out from the beach, because that's the fringing reef. Barrier reefs do actually resemble fringing reefs, but tend to be located further from the shore, and they can actually be much, much larger. And then the third type of reef is atoll. Atoll reefs are circular or horseshoe shaped reefs that encircle a lagoon, and usually there's actually no apparent landmass associated with an atoll. So we actually don't have any landmass in the middle there, we're just left with the reef around the outside. In terms of coral reef formation, well, the fringing reef comes first. So in this uh, diagram here, we have one, two, three, four. This is the order of the reef formation. So we start with the fringing reef. It starts growing in shallow waters close to a volcano or a tropical island. And then over time, the island subsides and the reef grows outwards. Now the distance between the land and the reef is increasing, and this will eventually develop into a barrier reef. If the island completely subsides, then all that is left is the atoll. So that's stage four in the diagram here. We've just got the atoll there. We don't have the island up in the middle. Now the reef retains the approximate shape of the island it grew around, forming that ring enclosing a lagoon. Here is another diagram essentially showing uh, the same thing. We've got this volcanic island in the middle. It's subsiding and leaving the, um, the atoll, the reef behind. Uh, eventually that atoll may also uh, disappear into the sea. The theory of fringing reefs, barrier reefs, and atolls representing stages in coral reef formation was actually first proposed by Charles Darwin in 1842. Now you've quite possibly heard of Darwin, he's the evolution guy. Well yeah, he is. Uh, he also considered, I guess, the evolution of coral reefs. Now Darwin speculated that underneath each atoll reef lagoon should be a bedrock base, the remains of the original island, which you know, had since subsided. Uh, drilling into atolls later proved this prediction correct. Let's move on to the importance of coral reefs, because they really are a very important marine ecosystem. They are actually crucial in the development of new medicines. Now you might be surprised to learn if you've had treatment for things like asthma, arthritis, ulcers, or heart disease, you may have unknowingly been benefiting from coral reefs. Coral reefs actually provide the source to develop new medicines. They also boost the economy. Globally, coral reefs generate billions of dollars and millions of jobs, for example, through food and tourism. Anyone who's been scuba diving or snorkeling on a coral reef will know firsthand what an incredible tourist attraction they actually are. Coral reefs also supply food for millions of people. According to the United Nations, around a billion people globally depend on coral reefs for their food and livelihoods. They also act as a natural breakwater. They help to dissipate the force of the waves, minimizing their impact during weather events like storms, tsunamis, typhoons, hurricanes. 
And of course, coral reefs provide vital habitats for marine life. You might have heard of coral reefs being described like the rainforests of the sea. That's because the biodiversity on the coral reef ecosystem is incredibly rich. Coral reefs only cover a tiny section of the planet, about half of a percent of the ocean floor, but they support a quarter of all marine species. They really are one of the most valuable ecosystems on the planet. Unfortunately, they are under threat. Coral reefs are vulnerable to environmental changes, including the impacts of human activities. These threats uh, range from pollution, from poor land use, chemical loading, marine debris, invasive species, overfishing and related harm to habitats by fishing gear and marine debris, dredging and shoreline modification in connection with coastal navigation or development, vessel groundings and anchorings that directly destroy corals and reef framework, disease outbreaks, which are becoming increasingly prevalent, so there are a number of threats to coral reefs. Now shown here are two that you may not have considered. On the left we have blast fishing. That's right, blast fishing. In some places people use dynamite to catch fish. In the diagram on the right we have a photo of cyanide fishing. So whilst using dynamite and cyanide in fishing may seem crazy, unfortunately they are actually a thing. Climate change and associated impacts such as coral bleaching, more frequent storms and rising sea level, these are also threats to the coral reef ecosystems. When the climate changes, the ocean changes. Now here is a diagram put out by NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Essentially they're like uh, America's NASA, but for the ocean. So here is a diagram that Noah put out, and as we can see, uh, some effects from climate change. We've got the warming ocean, sea level rise, changes in storm patterns, changes in precipitation, altered ocean currents, acidification of the ocean. These all have an impact on coral reef ecosystems. For example, with the warming ocean providing thermal stress to the corals, there was a very large uh, bleaching event in 2016 on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. So what happens is, with the increasing temperature, so xanthalae can't survive. So they leave the corals, and that leaves the coral white. So it literally is bleached. Um, but remember, they get up to like 95% of their nutrition from the zooxanthellae, from that mutualistic uh, relationship that they have with these single-celled algae. If the algae aren't there, then the corals can't survive either. So bleaching events often lead to the death of corals. So there was a major one in 2016, but there have actually been three more since then. And this is, of course, just one aspect of climate change uh, affecting the coral reef systems. So anyway, there is a very brief introduction to coral reefs. Uh, you could delve into the reef ecosystem in much greater detail. Uh, it is actually a fascinating ecosystem and unfortunately one that is under great threat as well. But there's an intro on coral reefs. Like the video, punch that like button. Want to see more videos? Smash that subscribe.